Well, hello and good day to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar, a special, uh, interesting topic today that many, many people are interested in, sleep. We are gonna be talking about sleep smarts, exploring the genetic and environmental factors behind high quality rest. And I have the absolute delight and pleasure of welcoming back a friend of mine whom I have had uh, the honor of interviewing in a couple of podcasts. Um, I first got to interview Rudy Nassif, who happens to be founder and CEO of Viva Rays. And uh, I interviewed him back in November, at the end of November of 2023, where we learned about his origin story. We learned about light in the circadian rhythm and about Viva Rays, how they aid in light exposure and how they help you to function better. Then I had him back to interview him again in a podcast uh, that came out in March of this year, 2024, where we dove into how light affects women's health and hormones. Tonight, we've got him live, uh, being able to answer some questions. We're going to be diving into specifically how light affects our sleep, how Viva Rays can help us biohack ourselves into better sleep. And we're going to be talking about genes. How does that work into it? Your DNA reports, what you find um, in your DNA 360, what to look for and the types of things that can affect how well you sleep, uh, and how we can biohack that. So first of all, welcome, Rudy. Such a pleasure. How are you today? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, such an honor to be here present with you for the third time. I'm doing wonderful. Um, as I said, there was like an awesome hurricane uh, and it was so beautiful to watch and gladly it passed next to us. So all good now. Well, that's wonderful. By the way, for all of you, if you are new to our webinars, if you're new to the DNA Company, my name is Dr. Lara Varden. I am an in-house clinician here at the DNA Company. I'm also Dean of DNA University, and we are so happy to have you here. And Rudy, I would like if you could please give us a little introduction about who you are, what you do. I already gave a little hint. So uh, can you please give a little introduction? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to keep it short because I've already shared my full story uh, previously. Um, but I like to keep it short, I truly believe that we as human beings, we deserve uh, to live in an environment that makes us thrive. And we deserve to wake up every single morning feeling vibrant, vital, and vivacious. We, we all deserve to get an absolutely amazing restful night's sleep to heal and rejuvenate at night. And sadly, in today's world, you and I and most of us, uh, we are living in physical environments that are not like onto nature. They, they don't have the balance and the symmetry of nature. And uh, most of us today, we're spending 12 to 16 hours indoors under artificial lighting. And this artificial light is silently sapping the life force out of us. And what I'd like to do is, I like to help people to view light from a whole new lens. Because when we speak about light, most of us think about it as something physical, as something that makes vision possible. It's a light bulb that we turn on and off and we take it for granted. But light, is information and it's it's this information that our brain and our nervous system that is constantly processing from the environment to tell our bodies whether we need to be awake alert energized doing amazing work and creative jobs or whether we need to be asleep resting rejuvenating and healing even if you break down the word information and you look at it as in formation, the slide that is entering our eyes is literally forming who we are. It's providing the energy to manufacture all of the different neurotransmitters and hormones that control the way we think, the way we feel, the way we act. Hormones like dopamine, serotonin, melatonin, beta endorphins, etc. 
are actually manufactured through light energy. So hopefully by the end of this webinar today, we, we start viewing light not only as something that makes vision possible, but as the most powerful force that shapes and molds every aspect of our life. And it's literally the signaling from mother nature that tells our bodies and ourselves when to do what and how to do it and how well to do it. That's beautiful. And it's, it is so important. And I love the passion that you have when it comes uh, to light, the significance of light. Um, I do recommend, you know, anyone here, if you haven't heard that first episode uh, that, or that the podcast that I uh, had with Rudy last November, it is wonderful to hear his, his backstory and how he got into all that really amazing. And, and we're going to be unpacking that, you know, as far as how light affects you, the different uh, neurotransmitters and hormones that he was mentioning, serotonin, dopamine, melatonin, the importance of that, the genes that are related to that. We are going to be talking about that tonight. So I'm sure you saw when you came in that there was a questionnaire. Uh, if you could please make sure, fill that out. We would love to see um, where you are, you know, right now, how is your sleep? Are you on devices? Do you use any kind of blue blocker devices, glasses? If you do, what? I, I see a couple things in the chat, um, you know, where uh, people say they use the eye flux to filter the blue light. They, uh, someone, uh, Betty uses uh, Swanic glasses. I personally haven't ever heard of them, but, um, you know, just, you know, we, we are here to help you understand what Rudy had said, the importance of light, the information that it provides to us, to our bodies, to our brains, to how we evolve and grow and behave and interact with the world around us. And the importance to that and to realize that we have the power and the agency to be able to manipulate that to our benefit. So that way we are ultimately the best we can be. So fill out that poll and we'll be going over that in just a few minutes. Um, so I have a little bit of a question that I, I'd like you to kind of go over slightly before we um, bring up the poll. And I would like to have um, just a brief overview of... Um, your understanding of light as far as what's going on in the evening. I mean, really, why is it important for us to have, you know, a, a light, the, the changes in the frequencies and the colors of light? And, you know, what, what is going on? You know, why, why is this so important now? Yes, absolutely. And since since this whole webinar is is about sleep, so I'm gonna uh, this topic is you know it could, it could go anywhere because there's no one area in our biology that light doesn't touch and impact. Uh, but since we're talking about sleep, getting a great night's sleep consistently and waking up feeling refreshed and energized doesn't happen by chance. There was a time in my life when I really struggled with sleep, and I've always thought to myself, "Oh my God, like." what's going on? How can I figure this out? And it, it was puzzling my mind. But the truth is that the science of sleep is controlled by a uh, universal force called the circadian force. Okay. And circadian comes from uh, circa and dia, which means approximately a day or 24 hours. So it's referring to this like 24 hour rhythm that every biological species on earth experience animals, plants, humans. And it's because we all experience this unescapable daily change in our environment. The day becomes night and the night turns into day. And fascinating enough, plants have a mechanism where they can direct their leaves toward the sun during the day and they follow that 
the movement of the sun so that they can harness that photonic energy and they drop their leaves down at night when the sun is down for conservation of energy and for rest. So every biological species on earth is wired to follow that light and dark cycles. And for us as humans, in order, in order to adapt to that daily change, we developed an internal clock that sits in the center of, of the brain. And it literally determines when we go to sleep, when we wake up, and the quality of our sleep, how well we will sleep, and how rested we feel when we wake up. Now, aside of that, this, this clock also controls our energy level, our metabolic system, our detoxification system, and so many other things. And its job is to time all these different functions to an optimal time of the day or the night within that 24-hour cycle. Because remember, like we can't be doing everything at the same time. Our body can't be performing all these different tasks at the same time. There's a time and place for everything. And when the body gets the right signaling to do the right thing at the right time, things flow effortlessly. However, when the body is confused, when it's actually 7 p.m. at night and the body is receiving that signal from a light bulb telling it that it's 12 noon, it gets the wrong signal at the wrong time and it starts secreting the wrong hormones leading to uh, chaos in the body. So when we speak about chaos, what's the opposite of chaos? The opposite of chaos is coherence. And I like to view all this mechanism it's like a coherence create, creation mechanism. This, this clock creates structure and coherent communication between the billions of our cells. So these cells finally could work in unison and produce a harmonious symphony in the body that we, ca we call health and wellness. Okay, so if we look at it, it's beautiful. It's like music. Like health and wellness is, is such an inherent state it's natural to us it's it's is the state that we are designed to thrive in but all we need to do is to bring ourselves back to balance and to extend the balance of nature into our environment so that we can reattune ourselves so i i like to bring like a a nice analogy so people could visualize it if you if you think again music in a musical symphony you have this uh, in an orchestra with many mu mu musicians. In order for them to produce beautiful and harmonious music, they need to be guided by a conductor who is reading the musical notes and instructing those musicians on what to do. Now, think about it in our body. This conductor is this master clock that we just spoken about. And it's reading those musical notes coming from sunlight and darkness. And it's responsible for telling all the different musicians, like the organs, the brain, the liver, the, the pancreas, and all the different cells in our body, what to do and when to do what, okay? You so, know, it's really interesting because ahead. every cell in the body and each of our organs have set circadian rhythms. I mean, it actually, you were saying precisely in the brain, there's actually a section of the hypothalamus called the suprachiasmic nucleus. And that lies at the center of the body's master clock. This gets input directly from light sensors in the eyes and keeping the rest of the body on schedule. Um, Dr. Sachin Panda actually discovered, how, he's from the Salk Institute, and he discovered how these light sensors work, um, as well as how cellular timekeepers in other parts of the body function. He actually wrote a brilliant book um, called The Circadian Code, where he really gets into this. Um, just amazing. Uh, and actually, you know what I'd like to do? If we can take a moment, have our little angels in the background, bring up the poll, I'd like to... Uh, get some of that answered and uh, and then dive into some of the genetics. So for our poll questionnaire, our first question, do you use screens leading up to sleep on a regular basis? And we have a, almost an even split. We've got 60% saying yes, 
40% saying no. Of course, then again, we did say leading up to sleep. Um, but I know that generally, you know, I oftentimes will recommend clients, um, you know, try to turn it off two to three hours before you go to bed. Like some people, I know I, well, I see my son sometimes he's got his phone in his face in bed. <laughs> so, I mean, you talk about right up until sleep, but then again, I can't say that I'm perfect with that because sometimes I'll be doing emails or work or doing some research and not turning off my computer, you know, until about, you know, about an hour before. But I'll tell you, I feel a lot better if I am off my computer, or off my phone, you know, after dinner and, and don't go back on it for a while. So I appreciate the honesty for everyone. And um, for those people who said yes, uh, you know, this is for you to understand the importance of how being on these devices can affect your sleep. Um, for those who said no, be interesting to know, when do you actually get off your devices? Is it an hour before, two, three hours before? Pop it in the chat. I'd like to, to see that. Second question, uh, do you currently use any light blocking glasses, apps, or devices? And here's almost an even split. Um, and uh, I saw, and I actually had mentioned a few of the devices that I saw in uh, in the chat um, with the Flux, the, um, uh, the Night Mode, um, and some of the other glasses. Um, blue light blocker glasses. So, uh, oh, and fantastic. I've got some answers coming in for how long before you go to bed for those who said no. So we've got like Diana saying an hour before, Barbara one to two hours before. Um, oh, Carol, I wake up during the night and look at my phone to fall back asleep. Interesting. <laughs> um, others an hour before. So yeah, it's, it's varied. All right. Um, but again, this is why you're here tonight to gain some information, to really find out what's going on biochemically in your body and how that's affecting your sleep or being able to go back to sleep. Our last question, or actually, no, I take that back. Our third question was, have you done your DNA 360 test and reviewed your mood, behavior, and sleep reports? Uh, uh, here we've got about 64% of you saying yes, yes, I have, and 36 saying no. Um, definitely, you know, as we're diving in, you'll see the power behind this information of what's in your DNA 360 reports, how knowing that information, you can then interpret any sleep issues that you're having and how you can support it, including the clock gene. And yes, this is a gene that deals with how well you regulate your sleep-wake patterns at the genetic level. Yeah. And our final question was, which of the following sleep struggles are you currently experiencing? And um, half of you, like just over 50% say that can't stay asleep. You wake up through the night. Now, there are many reasons of why that can happen. Um, so, you know, we'll get into some of that. Uh, but then I've got pretty much an even split between uh, you can't fall asleep and other, you know, that's about 15 and 13 percent, um, where about 21 percent of you said you can fall asleep, but you awake unrested. Oftentimes that works into toxic loads. You're not being able to clear as readily. Um, that's a little bit beyond what we're dealing with. Uh, and going to be speaking a little bit more into tonight, but we've dealt with some of those issues in some of our previous webinars on sleep and toxins. Um, but either way, everyone can benefit through the use and manipulating in a beneficial way the light they are exposed to during the day, in the evening, and at night, especially if you are waking up, you know, if you're waking up and you need to use the bathroom, because that's oftentimes the reason why you have to get up. 
well, you don't want to be tripping over things and falling and hurting yourself. So having a night light can actually be very useful, but we don't want something bright that can actually downregulate melatonin production or that will excite you and wake you up even more and make it more difficult to fall back asleep. So that's something that um, there are uh, devices and, and night lights, red night lights, something to keep you in that more calm um, mode so that way it's easier for you to fall asleep. So thank you so much, everyone, for answering those questions. Uh, and we will be uh, addressing uh, some of those things as we are going through this evening. So, oh, I see Carrie said, no sleep issues. Fantastic. We want to keep it that way. <laughs> so um, I wanted to get into a couple of things uh, and hijack the discussion a little bit more. And this, I really want to uh, jump into some of the genes, the roles of uh, genes in quality sleep, the ones that are uh, relative to sleep. And then, uh, Rudy, you can uh, jump in and talk about how light affects the particular hormones that we're talking about. So when we're talking about sleep, light exposure, um, Rudy had mentioned earlier, the different uh, hormones, these neurotransmitters that are important when it comes to sleep, you mentioned serotonin, mentioned uh, melatonin, um, there's dopamine, uh, you know, different pathways here. So I'm going to specifically talk about serotonin and melatonin because oftentimes those are the highlighted ones for sleep. Now, serotonin, serotonin deals with, um, you know, happiness and, you know, different aspects of uh, the way you are feeling. It works in mood regulation, sleep, appetite, you know, all of these things. So how does it work? What genes are involved? So if you've done your DNA 360 reports, this would be in your mood and behavior section system. And you would be looking at your five HTTLPR, uh, which is actually, we're looking at the length of the gene, if it's long, if it's short. So you might have an LL, which is two longs. You might have an LS, a long and a short, or you might have an SS, short, short, which I happen to have. Um, this works with serotonin transport, uh, which we'll jump into in a second. Uh, another one would be TPH2. This works in serotonin production. How well do you do that? Okay. Uh, another one would be uh, looking at BDNF. This is your brain derived neurotrophic factor um, that works uh, very much into how does your body regulate the light coming in, neuroplasticity, you know, how uh, it, it impacts the survival of the neurons of involved in serotonin signaling. And another one that is very important, I had mentioned the clock gene that you will find in your sleep reports, but also the MTHFR gene, as well as the entire methylation pathway. Methylation plays a very important role because this affects serotonin and uh, melatonin synthesis through its influence on folate metabolism. And that's through the SAMe production. This is really important because I don't know if many of you knew, but serotonin gets converted into melatonin through different steps. Um, we don't have to go through all the, the nerdy science about that, but it's important to know that there are certain aspects that are necessary for serotonin to be converted into uh, melatonin. And one of the main ones is through the methylation pathway. So I want to hand this over to Rudy on the production, you know, how does light and the kinds of light when this happens 
in the production of serotonin, melatonin, and how that works. Yeah, absolutely. So say you wake up first thing in the morning and you open the door, you go outside, you face east, and you're looking at this glorious view at dawn before the sunrise. And shortly after, what you start noticing is more colors of orange and red light amplifying in the sky and then leading to more of the blue and the greens. So what happened is as the sun is rising off the horizon, the high frequency colors like blue light, they have a very short wavelength as well as UV. Those get filtered out by the atmosphere because the sun is low on the horizon. And as the sun is starting to rise, these short wavelength uh, blue light and UV light start appearing in the environment. And the combination between blue, yellow, and orange sends a signal to the center clock in the brain telling us the day is starting. And the center clock signal to other hormones, like our adrenal gland, to start producing the hormone cortisol and adrenaline. And I like to describe this as nature's most effective cup of coffee. Like many of us wake up in the morning and we're feeling groggy and dragging ourselves, we're feeling tired, and then we reach out for that cup of coffee because we want to feel more alert, more focused, and more energized. But nature has gifted us with this most effective way of actually increasing our energy level and producing those hormones and neurotransmitters that will create the space for us to be ready to kickstart the day. Now, cortisol is one of those hormones. And in this moment, when cortisol is actually, um, when cortisol starts rising, it, um, the, the body sets like a cellular timer that determines when melatonin will be released later in the day. So the earlier we get the healthy rising tide of cortisol, the better, because that will mean that we will sink well with the sunset and we'll, we'll be able to fall asleep shortly after the sunset and get a restful night's sleep. Now, shortly after the UVA start arising in the environment, it's ultraviolet A, okay? And UV is what provides the necessary energy to convert certain amino acids in the eye, like tryptophan into serotonin and melatonin. And as you mentioned, Laura, uh, serotonin is this hormone that allows us to feel this inner satisfaction and happiness. We, we instantly feel that we are happy and satisfied with what we have in life. To me, it's, I connect that to a state of gratitude. And when I go and watch the sunrise in this glorious moment, uh, something magical happens. I feel a sense of deep gratitude and connection to not only myself, but to the whole world. And in this moment, you could get an insight that will change your life forever so such is the powerful of such is the power of like those neurotransmitters that we may take for granted but it's it's literally it's those neurotransmitters represent the effect of our relationship with mother nature and eventually serotonin will convert into melatonin later at night now how does that happen say you're outside you're walking in the park the sun is setting and as the sun is setting, again, light is information. It's subconsciously signaling to your body, brain, and nervous system that the day is ending. And that literally activates our inner pharmacy so that we can stop secreting or releasing the melatonin that we've produced first thing in the morning and we've stored in the pineal gland. Now it's time to release it into the bloodstream. And Melatonin is the highest antioxidant in nature. Not only is it a, a very powerful sleep hormone, but it also acts as a signaling molecule to activate autophagy, apoptosis, mitophagy. Fancy words to mean, meaning that the, the, the cells will actually activate the repair and rejuvenation system. Now, what do we need for this to happen? Naturally, if we, we are outside and we watch the sunset directly or indirectly, think about your ancestors. In that moment, your ancestors come back to the tribe and 
they're exposed only to fire or candlelight. Mm -hmm. In contrast, today, we come back to the tribe or to the box that we live in, and we turn on the artificial light. And those are the alien sunlight. And there's, a, there's, there's one way most people go wrong about this, because they think of artificial light as the light that is coming from their phone or the light that is coming from their screen. Artificial light not only comes from your phone and your screen, it equally comes from the LED bulbs and the fluorescent lights that you may be using at your home, down the street, in the mall, in the restaurant, at a friend's house. And when we get exposed to that alien sunlight, it completely disrupts our rhythm because it tells the brain again that it's daytime and it wipes out all the melatonin from our system and it increases cortisol the stress hormone, and this impact our hunger hormone. It increases ghrelin, the hunger hormone, suppresses leptin, the satiety hormone. It also impacts our blood glucose. We have literally uh, light in the eyes. It causes gluconeogenesis, the production of sugar from the liver without eating any food. So regardless of how much you try to control your diet and stop eating sugary things, being exposed to the wrong frequency of light at the wrong time is going to impact your blood glucose depth. And your blood glucose impacts your emotional state and your mental state. So with all that being said, I think two main, two main key takeaways there. One, light is information. And we want to make sure that we're getting the right information at the right time. And that is the information from nature. The second thing, very, very, very important key takeaway. It's not enough to, to filter out artificial light from screens and phones. You also need to be thinking, what kind of light is entering my eyes when I'm at home from, from my LED lights? Mm -hmm. Now, the third main big one where most people go wrong, circadian rhythm is about consistency. And this circadian clock is waiting for two main consistent signals. One, morning sunlight when you first wake up. Second, darkness after the sunset. So say that you've done this for three days, and I guarantee you, you're going to experience tremendous benefits. You're going to sleep better. You're going to wake up feeling more rested. You're going to regulate your appetite and mood. But what happened is, on the fourth day, you get invited to a friend's house, and you have no control over the lights in their house, and you're exposed to all these LED lights in their home. Only one hour of exposure to that LED light can throw off your rhythm one to three hours every single night. So that creates like a, like a roller coaster in, in your circadian biology. And this is where most people go wrong. It's not enough that you, let's say, uh, make a commitment, okay, I'm not going to use my computer one hour before bedtime. I've seen like a lot of people saying, I'm not using my computer one hour before bedtime. It's what, what I invite people to think about is after the sunset, what kind of light is entering your eyes, regardless of whether it's coming from your computer or from your phone or from, from your television or from your LED lights. What we want to achieve is that consistent signaling, letting the brain know that it's 7 p.m. when it's actually 7 p.m. So, and, and I, I love how you explained that and how all of that works. And I know it can seem a little overwhelming and I see some things in the chat, you know, going, you know, having some questions about, well, how can I get certain light types of light, depending on, you know, where a person lives, you know, and another comment about, yeah, night people or people working on night shifts are screwed. Well, it certainly makes it more difficult because they are forcing themselves to be off the normal rhythm. And unfortunately, my son is one of them. He does work night shifts at the hospital. Um, it makes it very difficult. And, you know, unfortunately, it's it's this back and forth roller coaster ride with his weight because of it exactly mm. what you were talking about you know tending to want to eat more but even if you are not eating as much your body is creating that sugar and it, your hormones everything is off cycle and it just it, it is really difficult and i tell you i have to give massive kudos to those people who choose to do shift work it's not easy, um, but let's talk about some 
some things that can be done. How can we fix these things? And by the way, uh, for our audience, if you have questions, please put them in the question and answer. Um, we're actually going to be going uh, through those. So start populating those. Any questions you have, any anything for either myself, Rudy, both of us, um, please put your questions in the Q&A box. So let's let's look back at what can we do? So specifically, I, I want to address um, this question that Mary had. Uh, can I get the morning light from an infrared red light? She lives in Seattle. Now, I'm going to let you take that question. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So even though you live in Seattle, if you were to go outside with a light meter and take a measurement, of the frequencies of light during the darkest winter day, what you're gonna see is that you're still getting that full spectrum ranging from ultraviolet light all the way up to infrared light. Okay, so uh, the sunlight emits all the colors that we see in the rainbow, ranging from the blue light all the way up to the red light. And there's the invisible frequencies of UVA, UVB, and infrared light. Now. All of this package controls our biology, and every one of those frequencies is designed to activate different enzymes that not only makes us a lot better at digesting food, but also it completely makes the absorption of, uh, of nutrients into our bloodstream more, more effortless and more easy. So um, when you are in Seattle and you choose to... Um, you know, stay inside and only expose yourself to that infrared light from your device, you're cutting yourself off all the different other frequencies that are absolutely essential to your biology. So instead, what I would do is I will still go outside and take as much natural light as possible, even when it's very cloudy and overcast. And when you come back to your office or to your home, you could supplement with your infrared device. And and in, in, in this case, you're still getting that full spectrum light and you're using that device as a supplement to add to your light exposure rather than replacing sunlight. So what about, um, I see someone here, they live in Alaska. Um, I mean, yeah, that's tough because especially during the winter, there's just maybe a couple few hours <laughs> of sunlight. I mean, you talk about going to extremes with circadian rhythm, the, the regular rhythm of light and dark. Um, I know that I personally, I've actually had a client who lived up there and um, using one of those full spectrum light boxes, you know, where actually is providing you all of the frequencies, the light frequencies that natural sunlight provides can help to regulate that normal rhythm, um, you know, exposing yourself, you know, inside during the day, you know, in the winter, um, that is very helpful. So you just kind of have to work with, with what you have. Uh, do you have any other ideas for someone you know, who lives in Alaska in that situation. Yeah, it's it's very tricky. If if you're living in Alaska, your your whole physiology and metabolism will shift from relying on light signaling to relying on temperature signaling. So if I was to be living in Alaska and I wake up first thing in the morning and it's completely dark and I want to wake myself up, what I would do is I will do a cold plunge. And that will actually raise my core body temperature up. And that becomes the signaling for starting the day. And some other effective ways to wake yourself up and increase your alertness and focus first thing in the morning and reset your circadian clock is via exercising or, or also eating a big meal, uh, like eating breakfast. But one of my favorite ways, because I also lived in Canada up north and the sun used to rise around 9 a.m. and set around 3 p.m. And I've, I've stayed committed to live in harmony with that cycle. However, I still nevertheless woke up way earlier than the sunrise. And the way I was, I was uh, getting the 
awakening response and attuning my circadian rhythm is by using uh, cold exposure and exercise uh, first thing in the morning. So speaking about getting out first thing in the morning, how much time would do you feel is best to expose your your face, your body, your eyes to natural sunlight? Yeah, that's a great question. So think of it as different phases and different windows of times that provide you with different benefits. The first window is as the sun is rising and you're getting that signaling that the day is starting. And usually I like to be outside for at least 15 minutes as the sun is rising. And depending on your geographical location and the time of the season, UVA light will start appearing about an hour to an hour and a half after the sunrise. So say the sun is rising at 7, UVA may appear at 8.30 a.m. And that's another very important window of time to be outside and to expose your eyes to at least 10 to, 10 to 15 minutes as well. Now, um, assuming the it's summertime where you are and that there is UVB because UVB doesn't appear uh, in all seasons and that will really depend on your geographic location. So for people who live up north, there's a time in the year when UVB doesn't appear. And UVB is actually what allow you to make vitamin D. So it's absolutely essential that when you are exposing yourself to UVB, that you expose as much of your skin and uh, yourself as possible so that you can maximize that vitamin D production. And of course, there are ways to do it safely. And um, it, it will all depend on where you live, what type of, what, what kind of, what, what, what's the type of your skin, how much melanin you've built, uh, whether you've built your solar callus or not. All of these variables will depend on how, how long and how, how you can expose yourself to UVB light. Actually, it's really interesting, you know, you're saying about, um, you know, exposing yourself to at least 15 minutes, you know, within that first hour of the sun rising, sunset. And um, this reminds me of a practice called sun gazing, now, which I have done. Uh, sun, okay, for the audience, sun gazing is a practice of looking directly at the sun, typically during sunrise or sunset when the rays are at their least intensity. And the idea behind this is that, you know, like Rudy and I have been talking about, the sun is a source of light and energy that can positively affect the body and mind when viewed in moderation and at safe times of the day. Obviously, we do not want anybody going out in the middle of the day, staring up at the sun, you know, and damaging their eyes. So timing is really important. And this is done only during that first hour after sunrise or the last hour before sunset. Um, beginners, if you are interested in looking into this, um, you would start with just a few seconds and gradually build up to a little bit longer, you know, maybe a minute or two over time, um, but always done in short increments to avoid eye damage. Um, another thing that you could do, I love to tell my clients to stack the benefits of what they're doing. So if you're going outside, exposing yourself to the sun, no matter what time of day, I'm not talking about just sun gazing, but going outside, just getting some sun on your face, also going outside barefoot while you're doing it, ground yourself. And then also do some deep breathing exercises, you know, activate that vagal tone, that parasympathetic nervous system, you know, just to get yourself centered for the day, you know, increase your BDNF, which sun does. And for those of you who have dysregulated BDNF, so this would be if you have an A, a variant um, in your uh uh, presentation. Uh, this is something that can help to upregulate that BDNF. Actually, heat upregulates and the the back and forth, what Rudy was talking about, cold exposure going back and forth also helps to hermetically stress the body in a beneficial way and also helps to upregulate that BDNF. So stack the benefits of what you're doing. Um, so that's, uh, you know, 
a, a wonderful thing. But um, just to wrap up, backing to the sun gazing aspect, um, this really is a matter of stimulating the pineal gland, often called the third eye, you know, producing hormones like melatonin for sleep, serotonin for move, you know, working for better mental clarity, inner peace, reduce stress, things that we've been talking about. So, you know, this is just a another aspect. So I'm going to jump um, into more of the questions because I've already hit on a few. So um, I've got uh, Betty saying that uh, her DNA profile indicates that she has circadian problems. Um, more of a statement rather than a question. Uh, if you do have a question, Betty, about that, I would love to answer that, but I'm sure I'm going to take it for how people, when they're looking at their circadian rhythm in their DNA reports, and it says if it's dysregulated, I happen to be one with a dysregulated clock gene um, where it affects my sleep wake patterns. Um, so what do I do? I really work toward aspects of what Rudy has been talking about. You want consistency, regularity in your sleep habits, in your exposure to light habits. When you get into that, you are setting up your hormones for, and you know, cortisol and ghrelin and, you know, all of these different hormones that we've been talking about, it sets them up to that normal rhythm, more predictable. And then, you know, you just start feeling better. So that's one of the things that I do. And I've talked about this before, uh, during one of our, a uh, couple of our other sleep webinars, um, this is coined by uh, Dr. Matthew Walker, who wrote the book, Why We Sleep. And he has the four pillars of sleep, QQRT, quantity, quality, regularity, and timing. So the ones that you can really adjust directly is your quantity in a way of getting to bed. At the same time, this is works into your timing. You know, I aim to go to bed by 10 o'clock, you know, plus or minus maybe a half hour, 10 o'clock every night. I naturally wake up like around six, 6.30. I don't use an alarm clock. You know, if I'm consistent with that, I feel better. I get better sleep scores on my sleep tracker. I, I have more energy, okay? So this all works together. So if you have some circadian problems, then you know we can dive into looking at other aspects of your mood and behavior profile, some of the genes that I had mentioned earlier, see where are you? Where are some weaknesses um, like the 5-HTTLPR that I spoke about? Remember this deals with uh, serotonin transport, but it can work into and how it can present is that it's difficult to prioritize incoming stimuli. This is even when you're sleeping. When you're sleeping, if there are lights from cars driving by in the window and the lights come on or you hear sounds, um, you know, your refrigerator or freezer coming on, that mechanical sound or an animal jumping on the bed, jumping back off. For people like me with uh, an S version in their 5-HTTLPR, it's difficult for me to prioritize the incoming stimuli. To basically what I'm saying is that you would be able to ignore the sound, ignore the light and stay asleep. My body is like, oh, wait a minute. You know, oh, there's a sound, it's time to wake up. Oh, you know, I'm feeling the blankets being pulled across my body from, you know, my partner laying next to me. Oh, that's gonna wake me up. I'm more susceptible to that. So it's finding things to minimize that blackout rooms, blackout shades, or a sleep mask, um, using maybe pink sound, you know, a sound machine to help drown out any background noise, not having your animals sleep on your bed or in your room, or, you know, using a weighted blanket, different techniques to help with any dysregulated sleep patterns or mood and behavior you know, genetic predispositions that affect your sleep. 
these are the ways that we can deal with it. And this is what we can do, you know, as practitioners for the DNA company, if you get your DNA done, we can take a look at that and we can help walk you through, dive into your life and take a look. Where are you having problems? Okay, here are your genes, here's your life. This is what you're doing. This is how we can help. So, you know, if you are interested in working with any of us, by the way, for our longevity program clients, for our precision clients, they get Viva Ray glasses as part of their program. Um, we actually gift that to you in the program. So that way you can protect your eyes. You can utilize this wonderful device. You know, I'm wearing mine. Uh, Rudy's wearing his um, to help you with uh, regulating your circadian rhythm. So I know our angels in the background could probably drop a, a link to find out more information about our programs if you're interested. Um, I am going to get to the next question. Next question by Mary. Uh, do contact lenses block the clock genes from working properly? Um, I, I think it's uh, more so than just clock genes, but let's let's expand that a little bit. Actually, Rudy, I'd like you to take this question in the fact that do contact lenses block the sun's ability or light's ability uh, to affect genes from working properly? Yeah, so that's a, that's an interesting question. I think uh, I don't have like a definite answer for it. I have I have like a, a, um, my own ideas about it and what I think about contact lenses. I think that there are some fundamental issues with contact lenses. Uh, the first one is that most contact lenses completely block the natural exchange of O2, CO2 that happens at the retinal level. And when I learned about this, I was really fascinated because it turns out that the eye actually is breathing in and out um, and is one of the only other places in the, in the body where there's a natural exchange of O2, CO2. And our eyes are really rich in mitochondria, these little engines that produce all of our energy. And Mitochondria really rely on three main uh, sources uh, for, uh, for, for optimal functioning. Food, light, because light is actually what breaks down the food energy into uh, ATP, and oxygen. Uh, so one of the reasons why I'm not a big fan of uh, contacts is because one, it's blocking oxygen CO2 from uh, the retinal exchange. Number two is blocking UVA, UVB, and blue-purple lights, all of which are absolutely essential frequencies to regulate our circadian rhythm, but also they are essential frequencies to build up what we call the easy water, exclusive zone water in the retina. And oftentimes when we are not getting enough UVA, UVB, and uh, the easy water in our, in our body is not getting uh, properly built up, it leads to like eye strain, eye fatigue, and 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 uh, dryness, dryness in the eye. And and another big uh, uh, issue with the uh, with the contact lenses. Um, there there was one more thing I wanted to touch upon, uh, slipped off my mind. But if I if if I remember it, I'll bring it on again. And I'm glad you brought up Easy Water. So Easy Water stands for exclusion zone water, what is considered the fourth phase of water, which is almost a gelatinous type uh, phase in that. And actually, um, there's a book called The Fourth Phase of Water written by uh, Dr. Gerald H. Pollack. Um, he actually uh, did his research at the University of Washington. Um, incredible information, but that's the, the basis of uh, what Rudy is talking about with that. Um, yes. And, uh, and, and in a nutshell, the, the easy water, the way it's formed is when light shines on water, it creates a split in the water molecule and it separates the negative from the positive. And it creates a battery-like uh, engine that actually drives blood flow and that our cells can use to do work. And one another, another very important aspect of our contact lenses, which I wanted to mention and I, I slipped off my mind, is uh, that particularly UVA light has been shown to activate mitophagy and apoptosis, okay? And 
when we lack proper UVA light during the day due to wearing contact lenses, is going to decrease the mitochondria's ability to recycle itself at night and get rid of the old mitochondria and replace them with new mitochondria. And with time, that start increasing inflammation and causes a lot of problems in the in in, in the eyes. Beautiful. Um, we have a question from Deborah. Um, she said, "Can you please tell me what kind of light to use indoors in the winter to help with seasonal?" affective disorder. Um, and basically just, you know, for those of you uh, who may not be familiar with seasonal affective disorder, um, you know, this is a disorder that is based on season generally because of the lack of light, um, less of, you know, regular sunlight or not, you know, people are not often outdoors as much during the winter. Um, their vitamin D levels are affected, those go down. So this is another area that you can actually take a look in your DNA 360 reports in the anti-inflammatory um, system, you'll see your vitamin D pathway. Um, is that dysregulated? Because you really should be supplementing uh, with vitamin D. Obviously have your levels checked, um, you know, and we've talked about this a lot in our podcasts and other webinars, um, but that is very important. Vitamin D is a, another hormone, very important hormone that works on over um, like 2,300 yeah, 2, genes, protein coding genes. So um, this is something that you want to make sure your levels, you know, are in optimal range. But uh, basically, and oftentimes light treatment is used for people with seasonal affective disorder. Um, do you want to speak into that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there was a time in my life when I really struggled with seasonal affective disorder. And um, that was a very, very rough time in my life where I was actually suicidal. Uh, and during that time, uh, I felt like I couldn't think properly. I was very emotional. I was extremely sad. I would like uh, rely on emotional eating and I would feel like like complete rubbish. Like I, I, I didn't want to stay alive. And it wasn't until I started learning more about light and circadian biology that I, that I was able to, to, to completely reverse this and understand that there's no such a thing called like season affective disorder. What, what what was actually happening is that my body was completely confused about the time of the season. And it was also lagging the resource, the resourcefulness within myself to be able to sustain myself within a winter season. And why is that? Because during the spring, the, during the summer, the, during the spring and the summer season, back then I've spent most of my days indoors under artificial light. I have not built my melanin and I haven't brought up my vitamin D levels up and I was exposed to all form of artificial lights at night that were disrupting my melatonin production and uh, completely disrupting my sleep and my mood and my serotonin. So as, as the winter approached, one, my body did not know that the winter is approaching. Now, why is that? Because fundamentally there's two main things that allow our body to shift physiologically from a summer metabolism to a winter metabolism. The number one is the shortening of the day and the disappearance of UV frequencies slowly as we move from fall to winter. If you think about it from a nature perspective, during the summertime, the day is longer. The sun sets way earlier, way, way, way later. And as, we, as, as, fall up, uh, as the fall season approach, the sun starts setting earlier by a few minutes every day until we approach winter. And this signaling actually tells our body that the winter is approaching so that the body start physiologically adapting, allowing us to sustain ourselves during a winter season. So take a, take a wolf as an example. A wolf does not wait until this first snowfall until it starts growing its fur. The wolf's eyes are connected to the light and its environment. And as the day is shortening, the pineal gland of the wolf start 
secreting melatonin earlier in the day, signaling to the wolf's body that the winter is approaching. And therefore, the wolf's body will make the necessary physiological adaptation so that it can gracefully survive the winter. And there was a time in my life when I didn't know this information. And when I was, I was sitting indoors under artificial light for 12 to 16 hours, and, I, and my, my exposure to, uh, to light was uh, static all year long. So my body did not know whether it was winter or summer. And during that time, I suffered greatly during the winter. Now, what did I change? What I actually changed is I started building my melanin in the spring and the summer by exposing myself deliberately to sunlight and building my vitamin D production. And I started blocking artificial light after the sunset consistently by wearing the Viva Rays glasses the moment the sun sets. So I continue to maintain that infradian rhythm, which is the seasonal rhythm, allowing my brain to know that the day is shortening and the sun is setting earlier and that we're approaching winter. And therefore my body started naturally providing me, providing me with all the resources that I needed to gracefully live the most amazing winters of my life. So I went from being suicidal in the winter to, um, to, 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 live, to live the most amazing times during that winter time. Now, on another note, many people talk about the sad lights and so on. And the issue with the sad lights is basically the sad light bulbs, they're taking the uh, LED light that is emitted by a screen, which is completely unbalanced. And it has this narrow spike in blue light that is not balanced and proportionate with the other frequencies of color. And they're amplifying it to a 10,000 lux. And basically, uh, th this is why I, I would never recommend those satellites because the, the light that is emitted from them is absolutely toxic. Now, if I was to recommend a source of light, what would that be? I would say you've all seen the uh, full, full spectrum infrared light bulbs that they use in the sauna. Those are really great because you could get those without them being tinted and uh, with red tints. And what would that give you? It would give you the natural uh, emission or the spectrum of the fire, but at a very high lux. And that will, that will really like elevate your mood and help you get balanced natural frequency into your eyes that will not disrupt your seasonal rhythm. Thank you for that. Uh, fantastic information. Um, actually, this kind of works in a little bit with the next question by Carol, and she's asking about night lights. Do they or do they not upset your rhythm, your circadian rhythm? But of course, not all night lights are the same either. Do you want to talk about that? Or Yes. So it's essentially, um, after the sunset, the retina, the retinal sensitivity becomes extremely high to light, okay, compared to when we first wake up. When we first wake up, the retina is looking for 100,000 lux plus from sunlight to reset that clock. So it's looking for a lot of bright, full spectrum sunlight. And the longer we've been awake, say 12 hours after the sunrise, the, the, the greater the retinal sensitivity becomes, which means very little amount of light, especially in blue and green light, will be enough to disrupt your rhythm and shift your clock in the wrong direction. So when we speak about exposure to light after the sunset, what, we're th what we need to think about is three main things. Number one, el el eliminating blue and green light. Number two, decreasing the brightness of light. And number three, ideally not having overhead light and positioning your lighting lower at a, at a floor level. Now that has to do with the protein in the eye melanopsin and how it's positioned in the retina. And due to, the, to how it's positioned, it's most stimulated by overhead light, which makes sense because sunlight is overhead light. So I would think that the best type of light to use after the sunset is light that is free from blue and green light, light that is dim enough and that is not bright, and light that we position at the floor level. Okay, so think of like a fire or a candle or a Himalayan salt lamp 
all of these are fantastic sources of light that will not really disrupt your circadian rhythm. And another thing to think about is if you have that control in your house, amazing. I do have that control. And in fact, in my house, the only lights that are allowed, and we live in a communal house, the only lights that are allowed are candle lights and Himalayan salt lamps. So technically, I don't really need to use my, my Viva Rays glasses in my house because I have full control of the light that is entering my house. But uh, when do I use the glasses? I do use the glasses anytime I'm not in the house. And why is that? To maintain that regularity and consistency. Because I don't want to throw off all the good work that I've done by going out and hanging out with friends and being exposed to blue light that will completely throw off my rhythm. And by having the glasses, I could make sure that I could maintain that consistency and regularity. You know, actually, uh, you had mentioned candlelight, which works into another question uh, Tammy had. Is candlelight also considered artificial? <laughs> Yeah, the, the question comes here. What is artificial? Uh, so evolutionarily, we've 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 our 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 bodies have evolved to be around fire and candlelight, and essentially those forms of light, they have very little blue and green light, and they're a lot richer in orange and red light and a lot of infrared light, and uh, these are forms of light that do not disrupt our circadian biology. But not only these. These are forms of light that also help us build our easy water and uh, infrared light from the, the fire comes in the form of full infrared light. And it has been shown to increase mitochondrial functioning and to improve the uh, cell's ability to uh, clean off inflammation and, and toxins um, at an at a orgo, uh, or, uh, organ level. So uh, be, beside the fact that those lights do not disrupt our circadian rhythms, on the other side, there's a lot of benefits to being exposed to those lights after the sunset. In, in fact, Lara, like if you think about it, in our modern world today, we are deprived from the frequencies that essentially come from fire, like orange, red, and infrared, when they come in their full spectrum form. I know many companies today are producing light bulbs that are red, but the problem with those is that they emit a very narrow spike in red, which is not natural to our biological evolution. And whereas if you look at the fire or the candlelight, it has this full spectrum in the orange, red, and infrared. And this is, this is a form of light that we've all evolved around and is absolutely nourishing to our biology. Wonderful. And this is why I love to go camping and have campfires. <laughs> yes. So um, I have a question from Janice, and actually, this is something I will um, answer. And by the way, hello, Janice. Um, she says that she is prone to uncommon side effects with 5-HTP. That's 5-hydroxytryptophan. Um, uh, it's a, a particular uh, supplement precursor to serotonin. And she's asking, would L-tryptophan be an option in terms of sleep and fewer side effects? And actually, yes, L-tryptophan could be a viable alternative to 5-HTP, especially with, um, you know, it, by experiencing side effects with the 5-HTP. They are both precursors to serotonin, but they work slightly differently. Um, L-tryptophan, this is an amino acid. It's converted into 5-HTP in the body and then into serotonin. Um, and then of course, like I had said earlier, serotonin is then converted into melatonin. Um, but where L-tryptophan uh, is naturally found, um, you know, dietarily, you'll, you'll find it in turkey, dairy, nuts, things like that. Um, it's generally well tolerated and can support sleep without some of those, you know, other side effects because there is a slower conversion. So the body has more um, of a gradual change, more gradual effect on serotonin production compared to 5-HTP, which is uh, more readily available Available. It's it's um, that precursor right before serotonin, um, and people will get side effects like nausea, headaches, you know, GI issues, things like that. So um, obviously, consult your doctor. Um, this is not uh, you know direct medical advice. Um, you know, so always speak to your doctor first before starting any new supplements, medications. 
All right, let's see. Next question, we have Marlene. And let's see. She says, my sleep report indicates I have a suboptimal profile when it comes to the genes that influence my circadian rhythm. I'm more likely to have irre irregular or disrupted circadian rhythms when it comes to my sleep. How can I optimize this? Well, this really works in a lot of of what we've been talking about tonight. You know, the regularity, the timing of your sleep, of your light exposure, the type of light exposure that you are exposing yourself to, using devices to help with that. Um, obviously, I can't give you details on that because I don't know what your particular uh, genetic profile is because there are several genes involved with your circadian rhythm and with uh, our sleep reports. Um, so, you know, in, for something very specific um, that is uh, precise for your genes, I do recommend that, you know, you contact our sales team, our client care, see about um, maybe getting a, a, a consult um, or getting into one of our programs. And then we can dive into the specificity of your genes, your life, your lifestyle uh, to help you with that. Uh, let's see, we've got Vicki and she says, um, Let's see. Okay. So uh, she tries and sits on an enclosed balcony. She uses blue light 30 minutes a day, also red infrared daily. Um, she has a small unit along with direct facial uh, red, blue, and yellow. And she uses pink at eight, then red only at nine. And she turns off the TV phone at 10. Uh, reads under red light until 11. She wakes up at one and three and she's not sleeping. Um, hmm. do, do, do you mind, Lara, like, do you mind repeating just like the beginning? Oh, uh, she said that she sits on her enclosed balcony and uses blue light 30 minutes a day and also uses red infrared light daily. Hmm. And, and direct facial uh, lights with red, blue, and yellow, then pink, and, and then she changes the colors she's exposed to into the evening. Um, but she wakes up at one and three and is not sleeping. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering whether that means that when she says the enclosed balcony means like it's a balcony that is more like indoor and she's using light therapy devices. And if, if that's the case, then... I wouldn't be surprised that she's waking up at one or three because she's not getting exposed to the essential frequencies of sunlight that will build up her melatonin first thing in the morning, which are uh, as the sun rises and later on as UVA rises. And essentially, uh, regardless of what you try to do later on in the day, if you're skipping the essential window of time when you have uh, a chance to, to, to reset your clock, and because later in the day, you go in what we call like a circadian dead zone. And regardless of how much sunlight you get, you're not going to influence your circadian biology. So technically within those uh, one to three uh, hours um, as the day is starting, I would say like definitely like being outside and maximizing uh, uh, sunlight exposure instead of those devices. And then later in the day, um, regulating the, the exposure to artificial light. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, I, I'm sure that that can give her some good information. Thank you for that, um, that insight. So yeah, I see what you can do to adjust from, you know, what Rudy had just mentioned and, and see if that works for you. Uh, we have a couple of questions from Corey and they're saying, if I wake up and don't fall right back to sleep, it's because I need to use the bathroom. Then I can fall back asleep. Um, I try not to drink much water after 6 p.m., but I wake up anywhere from two to four times a night. Um, Corey has an irregular clock gene with a CT and wants to know what does the CT mean? So the CT is actually uh, what we call a heterozygous presentation, meaning that of the two chromosomes, 
One of the chromosomes is one letter, C. The other chromosome is T. So they are different. If they were like a CC, um, that would be homozygous presentation. Now for the clock gene, a TT homozygous presentation is considered optimal. That would provide you a regular sleep-wake pattern, genetically speaking. If you have a C variant in there, I happen to have that, a CT myself. Um, this is where your sleep-wake cycle patterns are dysregulated. So that's what that means. And then, you know, what do you do about it? Well, the things that we're talking about, starting off with these low hanging fruit, um, you know, looking at doing the things um, that we've been talking about. Uh, but again, depending on specific situations, um, you know, toxic load, you know, what are you being exposed to EMFs, you know, other types of situations, the temperature of your bedroom, you know, all of these things can play a factor, even if you do have to get up and urinate, um, you know, using mouth tape, I've talked about before, in, in some of our other webinars, um, you know, so that way, you don't have so much dry mouth, you're not as readily you know, going to be drinking water, it helps to increase vasopressin uh, production, which acts as an antidiuretic where you don't have to go to the bathroom as much. So, you know, things to look at in that respect. All yeah, right. Laura, um, to, to, to add to this, uh, it's interesting because not, like about, about two weeks ago, I was, I was speaking to a friend slash client, his name is Joe, and um, he was like really feeling frustrated because uh, he was waking up uh, to go to the washroom a couple of times uh, a night, and this was disrupting his sleep. And regardless of how much he was optimizing his sunlight during the day and blocking artificial light at night, that still like really uh, disrupted his sleep. So um, there, there were two things that I said to him, and uh, I heard back from him, and they actually worked. So I thought I would share I would share them with you. Um, and the first one is. I shared with him about strengthening uh, his perineum through Kegel exercises. And basically it's very simple. You lay down and you tighten your pelvic floor muscles and you pull your perineum up and you hold, as you breathe in, you hold tight and count to three to five seconds. And then you relax the muscles and count to three to five seconds. And basically you repeat this 10 times or 15 times, three times per day. And that's one thing. And the second thing, Make sure that if you wake up and you need to go to the washroom to urinate, if you do have the glasses, make sure to put the glasses on and then go to the washroom because when you wake up and turn on the lights, it completely disrupts your uh, and destroy your melatonin production. Or uh, have candles in the washroom. Just make sure that you're not being exposed to a lot of artificial light when you need to go and urinate. I, and actually, that's a fantastic um, information. By the way, for those of you, he was talking about Kegel exercises that is spelled K-E-G-E-L. So again, these are exercises that help to strengthen that pelvic floor uh, muscles, and that helps to support the bladder, the uterus, rectum, you know. So anyway, both men and women can benefit fantastic. That can help too. Um, there are a couple questions here that I think are extremely appropriate and that I know that I wanted to get to. And um, this is between Mary and Carol, and I'm going to kind of blend the two and let you uh, do this. So um, she's asking, can you describe which glasses to use when? So we're talking about the Viva Ray glasses and the other two lenses that we have with them. One's a little darker orange, the other one's a darker red. Um, that's what uh, Mary's question is asking. So, because uh, she is part of our precision program, she got some, but she's not really clear on when to use which lens, et cetera. And then in with that, Carol asks, can you put prescriptions into the Viva Ray glasses? I'll tell you, yes, these are. So, Go ahead, if you can explain how to use all these different lenses. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the question, Mary. Uh, so 
um, as you can see, like the three in one is composed of three different layers that are designed to be worn at different times of the day. Uh, the one that I'm wearing right now, it's called the uh, light harmonizing glasses. And essentially those are designed to be worn during the day when you are exposed to any form of artificial light, whether it's from your screen, phone, or the LED lights around you. I like to use those specifically when I go to airports, when I go to malls, this is where like, I find the light is extremely irritating and intense. And what these glasses are doing, they're not blocking blue light because you actually need blue light during the day. And as we explained, it's the blue light from the sun that wakes you up and reset your circadian rhythm. Now, the issue is that when we are indoors under artificial lights, the blue light that is emitted from those artificial light is very different than the blue light that comes from the sun. Why is that? Because it has a very narrow spike in blue that is not complete, proportionate, and balanced with the other frequencies of colors that we see in a rainbow. And throughout evolution, Anytime we've been exposed to blue light, it always come with the polar opposite, yellow, orange, and red light. So they balance each other out. So essentially what these glasses are doing, they're taking that narrow spike of the blue and they're spreading it across the spectrum. So you're getting more balanced light into your eyes. Now, after the sunset, hopefully after today's talk, you're inspired to be outside during that time. You come back home, and then you clip on the orange lenses. Now, those are specifically engineered and designed to mimic the exact color temperature of a bonfire at 1,600 Kelvin. So they essentially filter out 100% of the blue, and we have a specific formula to filter high frequency green and keep enough green so that you can still socialize, do your evening activities without feeling extremely sleepy, especially during the winter time when the sun sets really early. So it's giving you that feeling of being around a bonfire. You're still energized, talking to friends, doing things, yet your nervous system is feeling relaxed and you're starting to wind down. So you keep this on at all times, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, because you're gonna be exposed to artificial lights. And then half an hour to an hour before bedtime, you remove the evening ones, you put the nighttime ones. Don't, don't then, stack them. <laughs> you yeah. want to just yes. one and then take it off and then use the other one. <laughs> yes. And and essentially those are designed to, they're very special because um, we're, we're one of the few companies where we've not only figured out a way to block 100% of the blue, 100% of the green, but also we decrease the brightness by 10 to 15 times, which is an absolutely essential thing uh, to uh, make sure that uh, as the light entering your eyes, that you're not disrupting your circadian biology. So uh, you wear these 30 minutes to an hour before bedtime. And you can think of these as like the red amber coil when, when the wood turns into amber coil by the end of the bonfire, when, when, when you're ready to go to bed and be cozy. Excellent. So, you know, and, and also if you guys have any questions, um, Rudy's got some fantastic videos, information on his site, uh, vivarays.com. And also you can purchase uh, Viva Ray glasses using discount code DNA Co. That's D N A C O for 10% off. So highly recommend that. Um, and, and by the way, Lara, uh, sorry to interrupt. I, I just recalled that you also asked me about prescription, correct? Yes. Yes. So yes, we, we do make, uh, all of our lenses and prescription lenses. And, uh, one thing I wanted to bring up, uh, for anybody who's wearing prescription, uh, sadly, what happens is when you go and make your prescription at an optometrist office, they actually add a tint to your lenses that inherently block 100% of UVA, UVB, and blue purple light, which is terrible because now we're cutting off, we're cutting ourselves off absolutely essential frequencies that activate our endocrine system and do a, a ton of different other benefits to our bodies. So what we've done, we came up with a system called the four in one. So instead of having the three in one as yellow, uh, orange, and red light we will have the base frame made in prescription and our lenses that we manufacture allow 50 to 60% more UVA and UVB and 100% of the blue purple light to pass through the lenses. So that when you are outside in the sun 
and you're doing any form of activities that require you to be able to see well, you could still have the glasses on and without needing to think about it, you're still getting that natural good light into your eyes. And then now you have three clips, yellow, orange, and red light that you would wear when you are exposed to artificial light, depending on the time of the day. Beautiful. I, and I'll tell you, I love them. I actually have a couple few pairs myself. <laughs> so yeah, they, they're definitely worth it. Um, last couple of questions. Um, Lisa was asking, could you please repeat the name of that full spectrum bulb that you had mentioned earlier? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mention like a name of a, of a brand. Um, what I, what I said is, um, for example, in, 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 in saunas that use uh, light therapies, um, I think one of the brands, I forgot the name, but I could, I could look it up, but basically they, they sell a, an incandescent light bulb that emit uh, red and infrared light. And those are like bigger bulbs and they're banned from the U S for commercial use, but, but, but they're not banned for therapeutic use, but instead of getting that bulb tinted with red color to filter out the other frequencies, you could get it with clear glass. So I would, I would look up like something like clear glass, full spectrum infrared light bulb. Um, and essentially you're gonna get the exact frequency coming from a fire at a very high lux. So the brightness is strong and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing device to use during the winter or even during the day if, if you're uh, in an environment that doesn't have a lot of natural light. Fantastic. Um, and our last question for the evening before we wrap up is from B. And she's saying, why is it that when I'm outside in the sun, by the way, she lives in the equator area, she easily gets headaches. Um, what is going on? Uh, at one time, she was told perhaps sunstroke, please explain. Um, I'm going to jump in and then I'm going to, you know, see if there's anything you want to add to that. First of all, I do want to mention, um, B, that living near the equator means you are being exposed to much stronger, more direct sunlight compared to people in other parts of the world. And there could be several reasons why spending time in the sun there could be causing the headaches. Number one, dehydration. Um, you know, intense sunlight, heat near the equator that can cause you to lose more water through sweating. So if you're not drinking enough water, if you are not um, getting the electrolytes that you need, um, those that could trigger headaches. Um, Heat exposure, you know, again, those higher temperatures for long periods uh, can actually, you know, lead into heat exhaustion, heat stroke, anything like that. And that could cause headaches. Um, also, if you happen to have any sunlight sensitivity uh, called photophobia, um, that can actually be triggered uh, and that sensitivity to the light uh, can obviously cause headaches, you know, especially for people who are more prone to migraines. Um, UV exposure, especially when you are exposed to excessive UV radiation, um, you know, that can irritate the eyes, the skin, cause headaches, um, any eye strain, um, you know, with bright sunlight, depending on if you wear any type of um, sunglasses or, you know, or if you don't, you know, um, there could be blood vessel changes due to heat, um, you know, that could cause uh, the headaches. So there's a lot of different things things. Um, it's hard to say in, in your particular case. Um, of course, this is not diagnostic in any way of what I said. This is just general speculation of things that could be. Um, Rudy, do you have any insights or ideas for her? Yeah, I'm just going to share my thoughts as well. And uh, essentially, um, what I think is when you are in an indoor environment, if you if you take like a light meter and you measure the brightness of light and the amount of light in that given environment, you're getting anything between 500 to 1,000 lux of brightness. Um, in contrast, during the day, when you go outside in an equatorial area, you're getting at least 200,000 lux plus. So that's, uh, well, like 200 to 2,000 uh, uh, times more than what you're getting inside. And essentially what happened is most of us in today's world, we 
have been living an indoor lifestyle that is completely alienated from the sun. And at times we hear that sunlight is great for us. And then we decide to make that shift. And then we, we start going outside and getting a lot of sunlight out of a sudden. And oftentimes what I hear is like people experiencing headaches or they don't feel good or dehydration. And it's, it's, it's very normal because you can just like go from one environment to another and go thousand times more intense light suddenly. You, you, you need to find ways to like crank up that heat uh, at a, in a, in a strategic way that doesn't uh, end up, you know, burning, burning that, uh, that meal on the, uh, on the oven. And, um, the, the way I would do it is basically when you go outside, um, uh, try putting hot or anything that will allow, allow you to decrease the amount of light that is, uh, arriving at the level of the eye. For me, my favorite, my favorite thing would be like a, a hat really and and trying to seek shade also like instead of being in direct sunlight right away um uh, being under a tree uh and uh seeking that shade and you're still going to get a lot of benefits and slowly working your way up to being able to be in sunlight without experiencing uh any form of nausea or dehydration or headaches etc well, I appreciate that insight. And Rudy, I really appreciate you being here, sharing your brilliance, knowledge, wisdom, you know, just amazing. Again, you know how much I love you, how much I love your products. Um, they are absolutely wonderful. And, you know, throwing it out there, you know, for my son, I had mentioned earlier, uh, he wears, I got him a set, um, you know, and he wears them at the hospital. Uh, you know, with those very bright lights, you know, with the fact that he's, you know, working night shifts, but he has noticed a huge difference in eye strain that it's lessened the eye strain, he feels better. Um, so, you know, it's helpful, even for those people who have chosen to work night shifts, swing shifts, um, you know, working outside of their natural circadian rhythm. Um, they are a godsend and as are you. I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for being here for our audience. Thank you. We would not be here if it weren't for you. And I hope you are walking away today with some great pearls of information, some new knowledge, and maybe we can uh, help to move that needle that we had in the poll in the beginning and have more of you sleeping better and be more aware of light and the information and health that it provides you. So thank you. Have a beautiful day, everyone. Until next time, enjoy. <laughs>